Hello neighbor, I'm Robert Burns and welcome once again to another edition of Sound Off Louisiana. Today it is my distinct and pleasure to have Miss Catherine Simpson here with us. Uh, many of you may recall about three or four days we uh, three or four days ago we did an introductory piece uh, introducing you to Miss Simpson uh, and we let you know that we would be doing a series of articles with regard to 18th Judicial District Attorney Tony Clayton. Uh, and many of you may have seen that uh, Miss Simpson, uh, regrettably, uh, she lost her mother to, to foul play some 13 years ago in 2008. Uh, and having just lost my mother, fortunately, just through, just through old age, but nevertheless, I mean, I, I, I know the impact of, of losing a mother because I lived my whole life with her and she's near and dear to my heart and always will be. And I know that's the case for everyone viewing this. Uh, but we want to provide this opportunity for Ms. Simpson to, to share exactly what all has transpired with regard to her mother's investigation and, and, and allegations that uh, things just aren't being done in many respects in the way that they should be. And, uh, and she has quite a group that's been formed uh, that, that uh, kind of serves as a collection. Uh, it's a Facebook page and we'll provide the link to it just like we did in the last feature. Uh, for you know allegations of corruption with regard to District Attorney Tony Clayton and the investigations into these family members' murders. So, uh, without delaying any further, Miss Simpson, why don't you let our viewing audience? Why don't you go ahead and let them, the floor is yours. You just take it over and, and uh, bring everybody up to speed. And, and uh, I think you're going to find her her uh, her zeal and her quest to be phenomenal. So. Thank you. You're quite welcome. So back in 2008, my mom was living in Falls River on the island side on Jaro Lane. Um, on a Friday, her landlords had not seen or heard from her for several days. So they went to check on her. They used their master key to get into her home and they found her in a back bedroom. Um, you know, she didn't use this back bedroom and she was nude and bloodied and they, they contacted the Point Capiche Sheriff's Department. And they came out um, in response. The coroner came out, Dr. Henry Kellerman came out and he declared my mother's death a homicide at the scene. Um, he put the call in for CSI. And then DA Tony Clayton arrived on scene. Um, after DA Clayton arrived on scene, the call to CSI was canceled my mother's home was not processed in any way, shape, or form. No fingerprint dusting, no spraying for luminol. They didn't collect the mattress my, mother was, my mother's body was found on. Practically nothing. They just had the Emmy take my mother's body and they left. So that was on a Friday. And on Sunday, the autopsy was done. On a Monday morning, the Point Capiche Sheriff's Office called my family and I in to let us know what had happened. And they told us that the autopsy on the previous day had shown that my mom accidentally slipped and fell and hit her head. And that caused a subdural hematoma under her skull, which killed her. We had no reason to doubt the police. I've never had many interactions with law enforcement. And so I was very naive about how things go and we we believed them fully and we moved forward with having my mother cremated i never in a million years would have had my mother cremated had i been told the truth had i been told she had been murdered that she had been beaten to death we had her cremated and the very next day i spoke with the coroner and the coroner did not hesitate to tell me the truth he didn't even find it an issue he told me right up front your mother was beaten to death. All of her ribs were broken. She has strike marks on her back, defensive wounds on her hands and feet. Her face was bloodied. Uh, she was hit in the nose. Um, <clears throat> he very clearly told me that the police lied to me. There was no accident. There was no slip and fall that caused a death, um, that she was indeed beaten to death. So after discovering that the police had lied, of course, I didn't know who to turn to. So I turned to the DA, that person that we are all supposed to be able to trust, the person we are all supposed to be able to go to, the person that is there for us, the victims, the person that is there to prosecute the killers and the rapists and the murderers, the person who's on our side. I called him up 
and he instantly was very belligerent with me. I had no idea that he would know who I was already. Um, and, and he did. He was aware of the case. I didn't know at that time that he had been at the scene. Um, and he told me that I was a crazy conspiracy theorist, and he told me that my mother died due to her lifestyle. Wow. Which always, you know, it, it, it makes an impression on me because that tells me that you think you would have done the same thing if you were in that situation. If the victim d deserved it, then you're saying, I would have killed her too, which is really egregious, shockingly egregious. And extremely insensitive. Extremely insensitive. It was very clear to me that I was a no one to this person. To this person, I was someone to be swept aside. And so was my mother. Um, you know, you come across a woman who is very dirt poor living in a rundown trailer. And I think what I neglected to mention is that they found the phone of uh, my uncle, who I'm not really related to, my mom thought it was cute when I was growing up to have me call her friend's uncle. Um, they, they have recently become romantic again. And uh, we all knew this, my whole family knew this. What we did not know was that he had gotten married. Um, you know, he's a lifelong friend of my mom, so he had been married recently. Uh, and they found his telephone at my mother's homicide scene which is why I believe they stopped the investigation, why okay. CSI was canceled, why nothing was processed. Um, I believe they don't really care who killed my mom. It was just done as a professional courtesy, um, whether he, you know, no matter who killed her. Right. Um, so I had gone to DA Clayton, and uh, after that phone call, after hearing the DA tell me that my mother deserved to die, and that there was nothing anyone was going to do about it, I kind of lost, I, I snapped. Understandably I so. definitely snapped. I don't know many people who wouldn't. Yes, it was, it was, it was quite, a, um, quite the conversation on the phone. Um, after that, I got in my car and I was only vaguely aware of my intentions and what I planned on doing. And what I ended up doing was driving directly to the wife of my uncle that my mom had been seeing. And I spoke with her and she was a kind woman and what I saw from her, I respect. Mm -hmm. She was a strong woman. Um, she wasn't going to just hear rumors. She wanted me to prove things to her, which I did. Um, and she said we would talk the following morning and I could hardly sleep that night. I, um, I, I stayed awake all night and I couldn't wait to hear from her. I called her the next morning and she said she had spoken to her husband and that she wished me luck, but there was nothing she could do. She couldn't talk to me anymore, and which is understandable. Of course, at the time, I was upset. Uh, and then I heard that um, my uncle had gone up to Tony Clayton's office after that and threw a fit that I had gone to his wife. And that was the last I heard of the investigation. That, um, that, that was the last of it for a long time, for 13 years. Um, I thought it had just gone away. I thought... I would never know who killed my mom. I thought it was done and buried. And I tried to learn how to move on from that. And in 20, in 2019, uh, my mom's case at the media, Jim Hummel with KATC in Lafayette, did a piece on how homicide victims are being cremated illegally, like my mom's case. The um, Louisiana law does say for regarding cremation, that as long as there are no suspicious circumstances or foul play suspected, then the victim may be cremated. Otherwise, the victim should not be cremated. And so, let me interrupt just a moment. In this case, it should have been pretty clear, Cook. Absolutely. And, I mean, you've said what the coroner himself said to you regarding your mother's cause of death, correct? Right. But nevertheless, the permit for cremation was, was issued done. and you were completely in the dark about the yes. nature of your mother's death. Okay. 100%. Yes. All right, go ahead. So the coroner's office did perhaps, maybe they slipped up by not calling me and letting me know prior to signing the permit for cremation that my mom's death was a homicide. However, they have been so wonderful to me and my family that it's hard for me to sit here and point a finger at them, you know, because sure. they've been kind, they've been contrite, and they've been very helpful. So, you know, that, that was a mistake that shouldn't have happened, but you know I don't I don't hold any animosity towards the 
coroner's office, um, just the DA's office. Uh, so, you know, so Jim Hummel did his, uh, did his special on the homicide victims being cremated. And I think this is a very good example of how things can become corrupt or things can become unethical because the coroner's association's response to that special was not to change their behavior to follow the law. Instead, their response was to get a senator, Senator Foyle from Baton Rouge. Who happens to be my senator, just as a little aside. Go ahead. He proposed an amendment to change the permit for cremation and change the law to match what the coroners had been doing rather than them just following the law. And I think that's a great example because if you get a DUI or if I get a DUI, can we change the law to change the blood alcohol content <laughs> that's legal and just go back? No, we can't do that. So this is a, a very clear example of how things work around here, what the authorities do to keep themselves out of trouble and keep the victims in a place where nothing can be done. And I, I'm assuming, I'm just asking, I'm assuming that his initiative passed both houses yes, and got signed yes, into law? Okay. it did. And they held the, I wanted to be there to, um, t to testify, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to be there, but because of COVID, I, I wasn't there on time. I wasn't really sure when the date was and I, I couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, so that did pass <clears throat> unanimously. <clears throat> and um, it's a shame, it really is. It's, it's hard sometimes to get families to understand why uh, cremation is not the best way to go. Um, and uh, ju I'm just gonna let everyone know the, the uh, feature she's referring to uh, was called Body of Evidence. Uh, we gave it to you in the introductory uh, feature that we did for this series, and we're going to provide it to you again for those of you who may not have taken the time to watch it. It's an excellent feature, and uh, Miss Simpson is very prominent in that feature. Uh, so let me let you go ahead and take back over. I uh, just wanted to make sure everybody understood that that, that feature is readily available, so uh, I'll let you pick back up. Sure. So after that feature aired, uh, there was another article written by Louisiana Voice and another article written by H.L. Arledge with Bayou Justice. After the media began to sort of pick up, I received a phone call from D.A. Clayton, while well, at the time he was assistant D.A., and he wanted to know what I wanted. So I scheduled a meeting with then D.A. Ricky Ward, with assistant D.A. Tony Clayton, with Lester Jaro from the Point Capi Parish Sheriff's Office and another detective with Point Capi Parish. It's such a mouthful, I, I can just say <laughs> PCPSO. Um, so we had this meeting and in the meeting I requested the records, the criminal file belonging to my mom's case. Louisiana law says after 10 years with no prosecution, that file belongs to the next of kin. So it had been 13 years with no prosecution and I requested the file and Tony Clayton told me I would have to fight him up to the Supreme Court to get those records. And he used those words? You uh, those words. All right. Which, of course, begs the question, why? And then the very next thing he said was that he wanted prosecutorial immunity in my mother's case, which, again, begs the question, why? That meeting lasted for about two hours, and I did not get the records. So I had to file a lawsuit to try to go to court to win the records. Folks, we're coming right back to you because Miss Simpson said there was one important point that she left out. So uh, we don't want anything to go unaddressed. So why don't you go ahead and, and enlighten us on the little point that she said that you left out when we did our prior feature. Sure. So after I requested the criminal file in my mom's case and Tony Clayton told me I would have to fight him up to the Supreme Court to get it, and I filed the lawsuit to get the records. Um, Tony did hand over the CD to me. He called it the complete case file. I pressed on to go to court anyway, I, for several reasons. Uh, there were things that I wanted to get on public record. And when we got to court, uh, Tony told Judge Baptiste, he lied to the judge and he told the judge Ms. Simpson has not received the records due to the delays caused by COVID. The courts have been closed due to COVID. COVID has slowed everything down, which was an outright lie to the judge. He had denied me the records and told me that he would never give them to me. It was not about COVID. 
And this is another good example, just like the Coroner's Association, of how they differ from everyday citizens. Because what would happen if you or I lied to a judge? It would be a much different story than the district attorney lying to the judge. But isn't it more egregious? And that is yep, yep. something the public needs to know about. Needs well, to and uh, in that interim, Tony did hand over the criminal file to me. He knew that, you know, the law is very black and white. The law is very clear. He had no standing to deny me those records, none whatsoever. So he went ahead and handed over a CD that he called the complete case file. Well, and I'll tell you, this is an absolutely fascinating uh, story that you're relaying with regard to your mother. And I want everybody to know we have a major announcement uh, that is being broken fresh on this feature, Sound Off Louisiana. I'm going to turn it over to Miss Simpson. This is a major development, uh, and I think that uh, may just, well, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you say it. So. Great. So once I received the criminal file, I contacted the cold case organization. The cold case organization is a group of FBI agents who are volunteering and other types of law enforcement who volunteer to solve cold cases. I sent my case into them along with the criminal file that I had won in court. And they contacted me and they said, we would like to work this case for you with or without law enforcement cooperation, which of course was a wonderful moment. I, I with almost or passed without. out. With or with without. or without. And I think they could clearly see why, you know, they may have to do it without. Yes. So luckily, however, when the cold case organization contacted the new sheriff of Point Capete, Sheriff Rene Thibodeau, he was very welcoming good, and he good. had a Zoom meeting with the cold case organization that I was a part of and he assigned a new detective to my mother's case. And that new detective has also had some Zoom meetings with the cold case organization and they're all working together good. to get this case solved. So I'm very excited and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what Sheriff Thibodeau does with the cold case organization and all of the resources of the FBI that are now available to us for free through this organization. Outstanding. So this case is very solvable and with their help, I believe Sheriff Thibodeau can get it done. Great, fantastic. It's a wonderful thing. Well, it's been just a, such a thrill to have you on our feature and I'll let you kind of say any concluding things or, or if you, you I mean, the yes. time is yours. That's the nice thing about a video blog. We don't have to cram it into 20 second sound bites. You just take your time, whatever else you'd like to say, and we'll certainly have more follow up. And I'm hopeful we can convince a few other family members uh, to appear and to tell their stories. Uh, I know I've, I've followed several that you sent me the information on. One I thought was particularly um, interesting, I'll put it that way, and I know it got transferred into federal court. So, yes. um, you know, there, I wouldn't be able, we, obviously, we can't go into all of that. In, and, and keep this thing from being two or three hours, but uh, you go right ahead and sure. make any concluding remarks you'd like to make. And I, but even before you do that, I want to thank you so much Absolutely. for being brave enough to come out to say some of the things you've said, uh, because it's not easy. Uh, you know, and, and we talk about cover-ups, and, and I think everyone knows the uh, extent that has happened thereof, although our governor seems to have some difficulty admitting it with regard to Ronald Green. Uh, but let's face it, Louisiana State Police is pretty much a disaster. I, I mean, I don't know any other way to phrase it. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that by the comments you just made, uh, that Sheriff Renee Thibodeau uh, will work with this team and, and we can get that, get your mother's homicide solved. Yes. Because I know that will at least, it, it'll never bring your mother back. Correct. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, but at least it can help cure some of the uncertainty and the yeah. and the mystery so you go ahead and uh, you know make concluding remarks say whatever you'd like to say you take all the time Certainly. you need because um, that's what this vlog is about that's why we called it sound off Louisiana to give folk an opportunity to sound off about governmental issues of concern to them and I'm thankful whenever I can get someone that'll appear on camera versus okay here's what happened but I need you to get in front of right. the camera and I've done it but I, it's so much better when you get a first person account that so. happens to me all the time <laughs> so yes there are many other victims in many other cases um, at least 10 that I could list off the top of my head um, a lot of the victims are afraid to speak out you know they've had things happen to them uh, 
that I don't really know that I can relate, but there are reasons that people are afraid. Uh, they're afraid, and of course I'm afraid to, to insult police blanketly in general. I don't want to do that. I don't want to bash the police. I, that's not what I believe, and it's not a situation I'm happy to be in at all nor are any of the other victims happy to be in their situations. This isn't a, yeah, let's go get them. This is, we've been traumatized. Our loved ones have yes. been stolen from us and we've been put through absolute abject, I'm sorry, you can edit say it. that, absolute abject hell. Um, you know, so this isn't fun for us. This is not a, let's get online and on so so social media and bash these people. No, this is, we want something better for all of the victims that are coming after us. 13 years ago when my mom died, I knew no one involved with law enforcement sure. or with media. And I was by myself screaming about cover-ups and conspiracies and uh, talking about the plot of a Tom Clancy novel. And of course no one listened to me. But the good thing now is 13 years later, more and more, well, it's not good that more and more victims have come behind me, but the good thing is we've all found each other. Yes. And now we can be there for instance, the most recent sexual assault victim, Nancy Rocco, we can be there for her and no one has to feel like I felt 13 years ago, like you're screaming into the wind, like no one is listening, like everyone thinks you're crazy. Solely based on the authority of, of these people, we trust these authorities. And that's, it. that's a positive thing that's coming out of this, is that we are gonna be there for every victim that comes after us. Absolutely. Um, it is hard to do what we are doing. You know, I've, I've received a couple comments of where people say something to the effect of, um, you know, well, you're so calm about it. I would be so, I would be so much more angry. And you can't fathom mm. the rage that I feel. You can't fathom the anger, the feelings and the emotions that come with this. We know that screaming and crying and wailing is going to get us nowhere and get nothing done. And that's just not something we're going to do. Um, but we're gonna try, we're gonna try our hardest to expose the corruption that's happening in these areas, expose these people for who they are and be there for the victims so they don't have to go through anything we've been through. Well, I, I commend you on that. I know all of our viewers do. Uh, and again, I wanna thank you so much for agreeing to appear today and, and it's my hope that we can convince a few other family members. I'll sure I'll have to go through uh, Miss Simpson to, to give them a comfort level. They can certainly look at hers as a, as a go by, um, you know, but airing this out, I think can only help. And I think it can only improve the chances of getting resolution to the cases. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, a video camera is unique in that it lets the instead of just the written word it lets you convey exactly in your own words and and uh, uh, i just want to really thank you for having come out today she made quite a little trip uh this was not just a little you know 20 minute ride so i'm motivated uh, she is so uh that'll we'll consider that to be a wrap for this uh, as most of you know uh in a couple of days we'll have the cosmetology board meeting uh, and we will test the temperament of a one Edwin Neal III, and uh, we'll see if it's changed any from August the 2nd, when I, most of you know that his temperament was, uh, well, shall we say, uh, more than a little bit hot. Uh, but uh, that'll be our next feature to come out after we have published this one, uh, and we'll just find out if he was able to calm down a little bit. So uh, I want to thank all of our dedicated viewers and subscribers uh, you are what makes Sound Off Louisiana, uh, and I'm so happy that the numbers are rising. The numbers are rising both to the YouTube subscription and the Sound Off Louisiana subscription because without you, we would be, I mean, y'all have probably heard and y'all know me and the ducks and the geese. I mean, without y'all, that's the only folk that would be here to hear all this is the ducks and the geese, and yes, they are surrounding us, uh, but I, I, I don't think they quite comprehend, and I'm not sure they are all that interested, I'll put it that way. <laughs> They're mainly interested in the bread and, and uh, me and Miss Simpson provided the ducks with some bread. Now there been a whole bunch of geese that came in to me. Well, you probably just heard one there. Uh, but uh, uh, my point is we thank you so much 
for your dedicated viewership and uh, just get ready to get tuned in for that cosmetology board meeting and I hope everyone has an enjoyable uh, rest of this weekend by the time you view this the LSU Kentucky game will be over uh, but it's as of now there you go I was about to say we got about four hour three hours give or take until kickoff so I uh, want to wish LSU all the best, and uh, we'll see you for the next feature. Thank you once again. Thank you.